If you have a copy of God's Word, we'll be in the book of Acts. The book of Acts. Acts is in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Over the last few weeks, we have spent some time walking through our series called uh, Building Healthy Churches. We have thought about elders, deacons, our gathering, and today our focus is going to be missions. Now, I'm not going to cover everything as it relates to this theme of missions, but after we read our passage this morning, I will give you an overview of where we're going to go so uh, you, can, you can have an idea uh, this morning. Our passage is Acts 14, Acts 14, verses 19 through 23. Acts 14, verses 19 through 23. Starting in verse 19, but Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and have per- and have having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day he went on with Barnabas to Derby. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, They returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. This is the word of the Lord. In Acts chapter 13, the church in Antioch sends out Barnabas and Paul. And as they went from town to town, people were coming to trust in the Lord Jesus. Disciples were making disciples. Paul and Barnabas were planting churches. It is the local church that sends out missionaries and plants churches. From Acts chapter 13, verse 2, the Holy Spirit set apart Barnabas and Paul. The church fasted, prayed, and laid hands on them in verse 3 of chapter 13. And then they were sent out. It is the Lord that raised them up. The church of Antioch that affirmed it and then sent them out. So the Lord raises up missionaries Local churches affirm, and they are sent out. Missions, whether it's church planting or international work, is a concern of the church. And as we think about missions, what is the mission of the church? How is the church on mission? The church, the body of believers, those who have confessed Jesus, the church is to preach the Gospel. We're to preach the Gospel. And in doing so, God will draw people to Himself. Disciples will make disciples. Churches will plant churches. And the Lord's kingdom will continue to grow by His sovereign grace. As believers labor, we are regularly reminded that it is the Lord the Lord who calls us and sustains us. And so as we go to our neighbors and to the nations, Christians are under the sovereign providence of our Lord to take this good news. And the Gospel that we desire to share with our neighbors is the same Gospel that we should desire to export to the nations. We want healthy biblical churches to be planted in our area, in our state, and around the globe. Churches are not to be planted and then left to themselves. They're under the care of the Lord and they should cooperate with other churches. And so as we walk through this passage this morning, you may be wondering, why this passage? Why this passage? Why why was this passage selected this morning? There are three things that we see in this passage that are evident in 
missions efforts. And these are our three points for this morning. We see the suffering of saints. We see the suffering of saints. We see that the saints are sent. They're they're sharing the Gospel. And we see the strengthening of the saints. Churches are built up. So if you want to summarize these points, you could you could say we see the reality of suffering. We see the reality of suffering, the purpose of sending, and the need of strengthening. So suffering in verses 19 through 20, sending in verse 21, and strengthening in verses 22 through 23. In Christian missions, we are going to share the gospel. Churches are going to be strengthened and believers may suffer. This is what we see this morning in this passage, in this text before us. So the first point for this morning is the suffering of saints. The suffering of saints. Let's read verses 19 and 20 again. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derby. So in verses 19 and 20, we see that the Jews that, that came from Antioch and Iconium, they started this, this harassment of Paul and Barnabas and they followed them to Lystra. This crowd, this mob hated Paul and Barnabas so much that they followed them and then stirred up others to not listen to them in the next city. This is how much they hated Paul and Barnabas. But part of this crowd started by viewing Paul as a god. They wanted to worship Paul. In verse 11 of this same chapter, Scripture says, the gods, or the god, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. So they called Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes. And then following in verse 13 of chapter 14, they wanted to offer sacrifices to them. So they, they wanted to worship Paul. They wanted to offer sacrifices to Paul. And Paul and Barnabas were bringing the good news that they should turn from these vain things to a living God who made heaven and earth. But the Jews that came from Antioch and Iconium, persuading this crowd that wanted to offer sacrifices, they turned on Paul. They turned on Barnabas. They viewed Paul as a god, but then quickly as a blasphemer. This crowd is made up of a variety of people, Jews and Gentiles. Those who followed Paul and Barnabas through these cities, but they were united. They were united in one thing. They wanted to kill Paul. And so these agitators, they worked up the crowd. Be wary of what the culture says about you. We don't live for the world's approval. People who are not rooted and grounded in the Lord may praise you one moment and want to kill you the next. People who are not grounded in the Lord also want to hear the praise of other men. People hate the Gospel and hate its message until the Lord changes their hearts. The good news of Jesus does offend the world. And we are calling men and women to repent of their sin and trust in the Lord Jesus to save. We cannot Disneyfy the gospel to make it palatable for rebels of a holy God. The gospel is good medicine for our souls that does not need any flavor. Being a faithful follower of the Lord Jesus 
may not lead to stoning in our context, but it may cost you. It may cost you your, your family, your friends, a raise, or promotion in your company, popularity. It may cost you. We must be ready to face a variety of afflictions. But as Spurgeon said, I have learned to kiss the waves that throw me up against the rock of ages. Our suffering and hardships that this life brings shows our reliance upon King Jesus. And Paul's suffering here, he is ready to suffer for the sake of Christ. Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verse 23, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Think about the pride that would swell up in the unconverted human heart when a crowd gathers around you thinking you are a God and seeks to offer a sacrifice to you. This is what we see in this passage, in this text. But Paul denies himself. He testifies of his conversion and of the Lord Jesus. He tears his clothes and says, why are you doing these things? We are here to bring you the good news. And so shortly after, they go from praising him to stoning him. That is an example of one taking up their cross and following the Lord Jesus. This is not the first time this group had attempted to stone Paul either. In Acts, uh, the beginning portion of Acts 14, verse 5, they attempted to stone him there. But Paul and, Bar Paul and Barnabas heard of it and they fled. Paul references the stoning in 2 Corinthians 11. 25 and speaking about his afflictions. He also mentions it in 2 Timothy 3, verse 11, in which Scripture says, My persecutions and suffering that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Paul was ready to suffer for the cause of Christ. The disciples gathered around him. He rose and they traveled to Derby, which would have been a few days' travel on foot, about 60 miles southeast of Lystra. Those who believe in the Lord Jesus must be prepared to suffer and suffer in a variety of ways. But our suffering is not in vain. The Lord is glorified and through sharing the good news, God will continue to draw people to Himself. That leads us to our second point this morning. We see is the sending of the saints. The sending of the saints in verse 21. Scripture says, when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. So this verse could be summarized in three portions. The gospel was preached. Many disciples were made. And then they returned to report to Lystra, Iconium, and to Antioch. This is missions efforts. This is the work of missions. Throughout the book of Acts, the gospel is shared. Once again, the gospel was preached in the town. So sharing the gospel is vital. It is eternally significant. We long to see people radically changed by the good news. Yet there's always going to be a group of people that says the good news of Jesus isn't important. 
Not everyone needs Jesus. Missions doesn't matter. People just need to find their own way and be happy. I have family. I have family who have voiced those things. You have family who have voiced those things. And when I leave conversations like that, what is running through my mind is that the various things that they desire, like assurance, peace, rest, only, only Jesus can fill. Only Jesus can fill. And there are many who call themselves Christians, yet they cannot describe what the good news of Jesus is. Beloved, we must be clear on the Gospel. We cannot assume when people say they are Christians that we're actually talking about the same thing. Being a Christian is not getting your eternal passport stamped so you can go to heaven. For those who follow Jesus, He is our Savior and He is our Lord over our life. In sharing the Gospel, all of our confidence is in God. We don't have to be cute. We don't have to be entertaining. We are called to be faithful. And when we share the good news, let's make it plain. Let's make it plain for everyone. To the farmer, to the engineer, let's make it plain. Friend, you have sinned against a holy God. And because of your sin, you deserve God's wrath. You deserve hell. So do I. But let me tell you the good news of Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, took on flesh. He dwelt among men. We need a substitute. We need one to stand in our place for our sin. Jesus lived a sinless life. He being truly God and truly man. He is the sufficient substitute for us. He took the cross. And upon the cross, Jesus bore God's wrath against sin. He died in our place. But He didn't stay in the grave. He was resurrected. And we have a living hope so that those who come to place their faith in the Lord Jesus will not perish, will not be condemned for their sin, but they have peace with God and eternal life because of Christ. The good news is not just that we are forgiven for our sin in Him, but we have communion. We have communion with the King of heaven. As Paul says in the letter to the Colossians, chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, and you, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Beloved, it is God who saves. Our hope is in him. And so as we think about the gospel, and the importance of sharing the gospel and missions efforts. We need to be thoughtful in our language. There's a new book that has researched some missions efforts that is entitled, How to Save the World. I think we can tell from the title of that book that their viewpoint or measurements are flawed. If one thinks that we can be so strategic if we can be so strategic and it's not made known in the title that God saves the world, 
God saves His people. This is, this is an unknown concept to biblical missions. That title, How to Save the World, is, is against what Scripture teaches. Scripture does not teach that we save the world. It is God who saves. God has saved a people. And we are relying on the Lord in all of life. In prayer. In our devotion. In, in missions efforts. We preach the Gospel. And should we be mindful in our efforts? Yes. Yes, we see this in the latter part of verse 21. Right? They, they returned and they went to these cities. They gave a report. They were accountable to God and to these churches. They did not do this work on their own. They went. They preached. But again, God saves. God saves. God works in the hearts of men and women. We cannot change hearts. We cannot change hearts, but we must faithfully preach. Being, being mindful of our partnerships. And as God draws people to Himself, we disciple men and women. So may believers be growing in the foundation of the Gospel, regularly spending time in God's Word, in prayer, and in communion with the saints. As I was preparing and thinking about our people here at North Hills, I'm not aware of anyone who is not striving to regularly spend time in the Word or in prayer. And so one of the challenges for us, for our kids, for our kids' kids, may be worship. We not become dull or lethargic in our worship. And that may sound really legalistic, but what I mean is this. It's easy for us, for those who spend a lot of time in the Bible, and then can view it as checking off a list of things to do during the day and not worship the King. Disciples grow in the Gospel, and we do not get tired of the Gospel. As we read the Word, may we worship. May we worship the King. John Piper says that worship is the fuel and goal of missions. It's the goal of missions because in missions, we simply aim to bring the nations into white-hot enjoyment of God's glory. And so in verse 21, the Gospel was preached. And disciples of the Lord Jesus were made. Followers of Jesus are going to worship Jesus. And Jesus alone. Martin Luther said, the worship of God should be free at table, in private rooms, downstairs, upstairs, at home, abroad, in all places, by all people, at all times. Whoever tells you anything else is lying as badly as the Pope and the devil himself. And so as followers of the Lord Jesus, do not be discouraged by spending time in prayer or the, or the public reading of Scripture. But in doing so, we worship the King. We have communion with the King. And when the followers of Jesus worship Him, they are strengthened in Him. Leads us to our third and final point this morning. So we see the strengthening of the saints. The strengthening of the saints. Let's read verses 22 and 23 again. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So as Paul and Barnabas 
were going from town to town. They were strengthening. They were encouraging. Speaking of the suffering that these believers were going to go through. So they were strengthened. Their foundation was built upon the gospel. They were encouraged. They continued to grow in their foundation of the gospel so that, so that when tribulations and storms come, their foundation in Christ would not be uprooted or destroyed. For souls to be strengthened, there's a central focus. Central focus on the Word. Teaching the Word. Helping these believers stand against bad teaching and guarding against error. So strengthening the souls is focusing on the Word. We are a people of the book. Paul and Barnabas were not encouraging believers by going around and saying that they would live their best lives now. There is encouragement to press on, to keep running the race. Think of how Paul begins the letter to the Philippians in verse 6 of chapter 1. He says, He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. The Lord Jesus who has saved you will keep you until you see Him face to face. Our encouraging words to one one another is not that you can do this or just live your best life, but we encourage one another when we point each other to Jesus. You couldn't save yourself and you can't keep yourself, but Jesus saved you. And Jesus keeps His people. When a believer is strengthened at their foundation, they are built up in biblical encouragement. They will be able to endure hardships and suffer well. Paul says to the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 12, I want you to know, I want you to know that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So the hardships and sufferings that believers, church planters, missionaries endure is not wasted. It's not wasted. Paul and Barnabas returned to the cities where they were persecuted. What did they do? The churches were strengthened, encouraged, and told to be ready to face tribulation. What is the worst thing that the world can do to believers? We die and meet our King. That's the worst thing that the world can do to believers. We die and meet our King. So Paul says to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 through 18, we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Verses 19 and 20 of Acts 14. Remember, Paul was stoned. Paul was stoned. Now he is reminding believers that tribulations, suffering is coming. Through many tribulations, be ready to suffer. You think of the song Amazing Grace, right? Though many, through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home. God in His grace and providence keeps us and will bring us to our eternal home with Him. As we close in this passage in verse 23, 
We see that elders are appointed in each congregation. These churches had structure. Paul and Barnabas shared the gospel. People trusted in Christ. Elders were appointed. And the church continued in its mission under God's authority, even though Paul and Barnabas were not present. God has structured the church to strengthen the church. These churches had appointed elders. There was a plurality of elders in these churches. And so this structure benefits the church. It wasn't about Paul. It wasn't about Barnabas. It wasn't about so-and-so. It's about Jesus Christ. And so the plurality of elders helps keep our focus in that manner. But also, we want to plant churches that will continue on in our absence. This is what Paul and Barnabas are doing. They're going to be absent. And it was the duty of the elders under the authority of the Lord to continue on in ministry. They send out. They plant churches. They cooperate and hold accountable. Paul also writes to the churches in his 13 letters, right? What is he doing? He's holding them accountable. They are accountable to the Lord. And so the Lord has provided. He's raised up those to serve His church. The Lord is going to raise up church planners and missionaries to continue to spread the Gospel. Luke chapter 10, verse 2 says, the workers, workers are few, but, but the harvest is plentiful. I want it to get it stuck in your mind that every time you look at the clock and it says 10.02, every time you see it saying 10.02, I want you to be praying for the harvest. I want to be on your mind to pray for the harvest. Pray that the Lord raises up missionaries and church planters. Those who will take the gospel to our neighbors and to the nations. There are those in our church that the Lord has worked in their lives and they desire to pastor and plant or revitalize a church. We have teenagers in our church that have a desire to go to the nations. We have those in our church that want to serve North Hills in a variety of ways and are sharing the gospel with their neighbors. Praise God! Praise God! And so, may the Lord raise up those who are not confident in themselves, but are confident in our King. May we pray that we send out and we encourage well. Hudson Taylor was in Shanghai and there arose some trouble in this time and he responded back to someone in a letter. The Lord who brought us here has taught us, has not taught us to go back. The Lord who has brought us here has not taught us to go back and so we are still remaining till the pillar move. Hudson Taylor's confidence was in the Lord. And I think we can greatly benefit from reading the biography of faithful missionaries. But the Lord has placed you sovereignly here right now. Whether you are sharing Christ at your job or with your kids or with your grandkids, or you desire to plant a church, or want to go to the nations, may we be faithful in our witness. And as this passage ends, these believers were committed to the sovereign hand of the Lord. The phrase says, in whom they have believed. We're reminded in an earlier portion of Acts 14, the crowd was trying to worship Paul. These believers did not place their faith in Paul. Their faith was in the Lord Jesus. So Christians, share the Gospel. We take the good news to our neighbors 
and to the nations under the Lord's sovereign hand. We rest well because our God is sovereign. We must be aware of the reality of suffering, the purpose of sending missionaries and church planters, and the need to strengthen churches. And may we pray for these things and may we be faithful in our task. A life lived for the Lord Jesus Christ is not wasted. We only get one life and it will soon pass. Only what is done for Christ will last. Let's pray. Lord, Your church, Your people, those whom You have sought and bought with the blood of Your Son, we are a people who are totally hopeless without You. And we are dependent upon You in everything. From the second we arise in the morning to our slumber, we are dependent. We are depending upon You. Lord, we need You. So press home the truths of the Gospel on our hearts. Stir our hearts with the desire to share the Gospel. Lord, there are many. There are many who are ruined in their sin in this world. Yet You have given Your people the good news of Christ that saves. So Lord, may we take the Gospel as we go to our neighbors, as we go around the country and we go to the nations. Lord, may You continue to sustain us. May we rest in Your sovereign hand over all things. Lord, You are the only Sovereign. You are the only Sovereign. And we rest well in You. We go and we can rest because You are King. All this we pray in Christ's name.